the physicist and author Carlo Rivelli has a new book out, Inaximanda. And I wanted to say something about it because it seems to me to be a great example of a deeply flawed way of talking about ancient Greek philosophy and its relationship to modern science. To cut to the chase, there is a powerful myth that shapes much of the discussion of modern science, which goes like this. An inevitable conflict exists between science and religion, which science must win. The reason victory is so crucial is that nothing less than the future of civilization depends upon it. Originally, the myth explains, human beings relied on superstitious accounts of why things happen. Zeus is angry and thunderbolts fall from the heavens, that kind of thing. But then came the ancient Greek philosophers. They challenged such nonsense and, in its place, sought naturalistic explanations for events and phenomena which are devoid of divine agency. Inaximander, for example, said that thunder and lightning happen from wind. That removal of the gods was a shift of inestimable value, the myth continues, and has a long progressive history manifest most brilliantly in the flourishing of modern science. Ravelli is an eloquent purveyor of the story. He develops it and explains why it matters as he sees it in his new book, Anaximander. This little known pre-Socratic philosopher outside of specialist circles was born in Miletus around 610 BCE and according to Ravelli should be placed alongside Copernicus, Galileo and Einstein as one of the geniuses of science. The reason for this highest of accolades is that a case can be made for Anaximander seeding the tremendous conceptual leap of deriving explanations that do not resort to the supernatural. However, Ravelli has a problem, a big problem. His case rests on a set of assumptions that look increasingly untenable and untrue, and even more interestingly, undesirable. This is not to say that Anaximander didn't have strikingly innovative ideas about the cosmos and life on Earth. He did. He proposed that our planet floats in space in a way akin to how it's described by modern astrophysics. And also that all life on Earth is connected in a way that can look a bit like evolution. However, his seemingly scientific proposals like those of the philosophers that came after him, are precisely that, seemingly scientific accounts. The latest scholarship on the period shows that it is only by reading back from the vantage of modern assumptions that the interlacing of gods and mythology in ancient theories can be either marginalised or ignored. Whatever science was back then, it is radically unlike what science has become now. For example, the Cambridge professor of ancient philosophy, David Sedley, argues that the few fragments of Anaximander's writings that survive imply that he detected the presence of a divine lawmaker in the phenomena which surround us. Justice is written into the patterning of things Anaximander proposed in the only pericope directly attributable to him, which survives. Ravelli knows about Anaximander's reference to cosmic justice and interprets it as a vague analogy. But Sedley concludes differently. The implication is that the supposed first naturalist was in fact a creationist, which nowadays is about the worst accusation that can be hurled at a scientist. Justice describes and shapes the cosmos. 
Little wonder Ravelli dismisses the remark. Take another difference. There is far more reason to assume than doubt that Anaximander shared the widespread belief that the stars are gods. Take, for instance, the remark provided by Stobaeus, an anthologist of ancient Greek writers. He records, Anaximander said that the unlimited heavens are gods. Another modern scholar, the historian of science, Daryl LeHue, considers the text, noting that it almost always goes unquoted and unacknowledged in modern commentary. Ravelli can be added to the list of writers who sidestep it. That said, pre-Socratics like Anaximander did start to discuss the cosmos in a way different from their predecessors. This shift is why we can say that philosophy began with them. But the mistake is to conclude anachronistically that, like a modern atheist, they were undermining and attacking the idea that anthropomorphic deities cause things to happen. Because when you consider all that these philosophers wrote, a different motivation emerges. The philosophers did critique accounts of divine intervention, yes, remember angry Zeus and the thunderbolt, with the weather supposedly a byproduct of divine whims and moods. However, the philosophers rejected such proposals, not because they didn't believe in the gods and their participation in the world, but rather because they believed wild tales told about the gods were incorrect and impious. Take another pre-Socratic philosopher, Xenophanes. He remarked that if horses, cows and lions had gods, they would look like horses, cows and lions, with the implication that human beings anthropomorphize deities. But Xenophanes is not objecting to the belief, but to the crude anthropomorphization. Divine power is greater, subtler, wiser than that, he also wrote. So this takes us back to Ravelli's agenda, about which he is explicit in the book. He wants to explain why science is so valuable, arguing that its worth is not in the making of predictions, which it does, nor in the proposing and testing of theories, which it does too. Rather, he argues that science is an attitude which seeks continual gradual modifications to our ideas about the world. It is a practice of intellectual freedom. Unlike religion, he adds, and unlike Christianity in particular. In fact, part of his telling of the conflict myth is that when Christianity came to dominate the Western world in the 4th century CE, it thwarted the advances of the ancient Greeks by replacing democracy with theocracy. Absolutism eclipsed critique. The secularization of public life, which in another anachronism he says was championed by ancient Athens, went into reverse. Such claims are hard to understand from the pen of an educated man. Ravelli, for example, has praised Dante in previous writings, and so must know that the group of individuals most fiercely condemned in the Divine Comedy are the Popes. Further, even a cursory reading of the New Testament reveals that rows, critique and reinterpretations lay at the heart of Christian life from the get-go. St Paul was nothing if not an argumentative man. How can Ravelli's blindness be explained. I think that he is worried about the status of science today, as if anti-science movements might undo the advances of modern times and this intellectual freedom. He needs an enemy, and the myth that science and religion are at loggerheads provides him with one. But this is a dangerous move, more likely to undermine science than support it, in my view. Partly that's because the myth does not stand up to the scrutiny of scholarship and so undermines the power of the critique and freedom, 
Ravelli so rightly values. But more interestingly, it means he doesn't have to pursue the question of why people might be wary of science. My sense is that there is a fear that the scientific attitude might be doing as much harm as good for reasons that are intimately connected to the story that science and religion are at war. Each discipline deals with a different facet of reality. Science with the material world, analysable by the natural sciences. Religion with our relationship to immaterial reality, explored by theology and metaphysics. As one of the founding figures of quantum theory, von Heisenberg wrote in his book Physics and Philosophy, scientific naturalism alone is, quote, obviously too narrow for an understanding of the essential parts of reality, unquote. For Heisenberg, those essential parts include mind, soul and God. They are essential partly because they emerge when asking why the cosmos is intelligible and so also when asking why science is possible. They can also account for why purpose, value and existence itself matter so much to human beings, qualities which are denied by the meaningless cosmic mechanisms described by a narrower view of modern science alone. So expansive, inclusive, humane forms of knowledge are what are needed today. And pitching science against religion is likely to undo that and so make science seem more inhumane to the many and so escalate the need for its defence, according to figures like Ravelli. But my guess is that Anaximander understood that expansive, inclusive, humane forms of knowledge are needed to describe the cosmos, which is why he made reference to dynamics such as justice in the heavens and saw the stars as living forms. In other words, rather than pitching an Aximander as a scientist against religion, Ravelli could realise that an Aximander, his hero, is even wiser than Ravelli himself can account for.